This is Join Us in France, episode 69. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. Hey, she's back. I'm back. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. Yes, yes, yes. And she has stories for us today. About? About. <laughs> about two things that are beginning with the letter A. We'll start from the beginning. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about two places in the wonderful city of Toulouse, where we both live. And they are two museums. One is called the Augustin, and the other is called the Abattoir. And we're going to talk about what they were and what they are. Yeah. Very good, very good. But before we get started, I got to say thank you to Anna Tinsman for your donation. Thank you very much. And also, I had some problems this week with uh, the, the RSS feed for the show. Now, I don't want to bore you with uh, all of this, but it took quite a bit of troubleshooting. And I think I'm not quite out of the woods yet. I'm going to have to make some changes to how I set this up. So I would really, really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the show because then your podcatcher is going to download the show whenever it's available. And then you can listen to it later because, you know, a podcast is radio on demand. And in that way, if the podcast happens to break and then I fix it an hour later and then it breaks again and that sort of thing, you'll have the show in your phone or device and you'll be able to listen to it at will. So there you go. That's the announcement for today. Good advice. Yes. So abattoir. Abattoir. The gruesome place. The oh, gruesome place. No, we're going to start. I want to start with the August. Town. Okay, okay. But, but actually, we'll keep the gruesome the, stuff. Yeah, after. but just to give you an idea, the, we, we, you and I both know, and we've already talked about this in certain certain uh, podcasts and, and in lots of other uh, venues, that uh, in France, and I guess it's true also in lots of other countries, particularly in Europe, that uh, very often buildings that once were something else become museums. Mm -hmm. Right, like we know, the most famous example in France, of course, is the Louvre, of course, which was a huge palace for kings, and now, of course, is one of the biggest art museums in the world, if not the biggest. And <laughs> so, um, I was thinking about that in relation to Toulouse, and uh, I, and also because I was thinking about the famous style of architecture that we have here, which, of course, is made largely from brick. Right, and it was really the idea of the fact that both of these buildings were very beautiful buildings, even though they're from very, very different time periods, mm -hmm. and that they're both made out of brick, Yeah, and uh, they're very beautiful. And then I was thinking about the buildings, and then I was thinking, well, they're both art museums that mm -hmm. cover different time periods. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about what they originally were, and I thought, oh, that's really an interesting connection. So that's okay. kind of, you know, how my little synapses work <laughs> these days. No, know. it sounds really interesting it's to kind of link them huh? yeah, that way. Yeah. So, of course... Uh, I was thinking also, and I'm not 100% certain of this, but as far as I know, in the United States, most of the buildings that we have that are museums are built as museum buildings. And obviously, that's partly because in the United States, well, everything yeah, is recent. much younger, yeah. right? For instance, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, even though it looks like it was once a palace, in fact, was built to be a museum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that all the buildings that belong to the Smithsonian are the same, hmm. that they were really designed in some kind of neoclassical fancy way, right. but they really are designed so that the space is created to be a museum space. Yeah, in France, a lot of museums are just, they were something else They were first. something else, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that, so that made me think about well, how we, have a we lot compare more history. these. Yeah, so, so I was thinking, there are, there are a couple of things. First, um, the materials, which of course is the brick, you know, they're both mm -hmm. very, very beautiful. And one of them, the Augustin, because I figured if you don't, it's okay. We'll just bounce back and forth a teeny little bit before That's we fine. describe the two of them. The irony, if you will, of the, the combination is that the Augustin is a building that was built in 1309. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Right? And uh, the Abattoir was built in the 1820s. Right, a lot more recent. So it's a lot more recent. Yeah. And so you have a spread of 500 years basically, between the two. Mm -hmm. And yeah, both of them were built m largely of brick, almost exclusively of brick. Yeah. Both of them had very specific other functions. Mm -hmm. And by a twist of fate and history, yeah. both of them have turned into art museums. Yeah. And it's true also that nowadays in France, you don't see a lot of new construction no. that's in brick. Right. It's mostly stucco. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what people put on their houses. That's right. Oh, and another thing that I wonder if you have noticed that. You notice that for a few years, like um, in the, oh, it was like 2008, 2009, a lot of new houses were like cubes with a flat roof. Yeah. Flat roof. Right. Well, that's completely gone already. It is gone. It's gone. I don't see. We have new constructions going up in our village yeah. that started this year. And not a one of them is a cube. Well, it doesn't. Cubes don't belong here. I mean, really, <laughs> <laughs> cubes go away. It's like I actually live in a cube. Why am I saying that? I don't know. I no, mean, but your but cube has a, has a pitch has a roof has no, it doesn't. But it has it, it doesn't has, no, but it has brick and stone, which are the materials on the uh, it fronts with brick and stone. Oh, so that's that, true. That gives it the old feeling of of the area because those you know river river stone and brick are basically the two oldest materials. That's that were used. true. So your house is the hinge between the the, the old the, and the new. Yeah, the, yeah, the, <laughs> the old and the. But, but why a cube? I don't. No, cubes don't belong here. Yeah, they, really, yeah, they should yeah. go away. <laughs> I don't know. Why are we talking about cubes? Because anyway. I just noticed that, that this that this fad for houses that are adjoining cubes with flat roofs, yeah. usually they put two adjoining cubes right. like, uh, oh, they're together. Like, pre, pre, like prefab. Yeah, they're like, so you have two cubes and then they put a third one on right. top. Right, exactly. And, and all of them have flat roofs. Well, you know, that is probably inspired by containers. Uh, containers going on ships across oh, maybe. the ocean. And, and the other thing that happened just recently in France is that the the windows, so the the vinyl material or the or the aluminum windows, yeah. the window material is black. I mean, not the glass, obviously. Right, the, glass the framing. Black, but the framing of yeah. the window, <clears throat> they're all black. Garage doors are all black. Mm. Did you notice that? No. New constructions, they're all like that anymore. I, uh, anyway, the things I think about. That's, yeah. f that's from walking too many dogs. I walk and I look at stuff and I go, why do they pick that black <laughs> window? <laughs> Sorry, I've, I'm taking you far, far away from... Um... I'm trying to figure out how your brain worked in that connection. I really can't. I, okay. You, you really have lost me there. Okay. Oh, I know we're talking about construction yeah. styles. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Let's get back to that. Let's go back to traditional <laughs> building materials. and yep. to, Yes, what you started off by saying, which is absolutely true, of course, is that one of the things that makes it very specific... Uh, to Toulouse, and it is also one of the things that makes it very beautiful, Toulouse and the region right around it, is that this is a largely brick area as opposed to most of France in traditional materials, right. which, uh, which is mostly stone. Yeah. And, of course, we're still talking traditional materials because these days both stone and brick are, in fact, quite expensive, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is why they use cement block. But... Um, Talking about the Augustin and the Abattoir, I just, I think in my mind, I was really interested in the uh, juxtaposition, both of both buildings, what happened to them, the difference in time period from when they were built, and also, and I think this is really important because it really has a lot to do with what makes uh, things that are interesting to visit, especially here in, in Toulouse, is that they're both very lovely places to go. Yeah. And, and they're diametrically opposed in almost every single way. So <laughs> maybe we should start by talking about the older of the two, which is, of course, the Augustin. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Augustin. Augustines, I guess you would it say. It was the Augustinian uh, order. Okay, okay. Which was a monastic, monastic order. Yes. Uh, Toulouse... Uh, just, just very, very briefly, Toulouse was and and really stayed for centuries a city with an enormous number of uh, monks, of monasteries, and of monasteries within the old city center. Mm -hmm. uh, it, historically, is a city that had an enormous amount of land given over to the different m monastic orders. And this particular one, uh, which is a... a an order of monks who are supposed to be hermits, which of course means they're not supposed to leave the monastery, mm. which is makes it's a little bit ironic because even though it was built starting in the 1300s, by the 1300s there were lots of other monastic orders in uh, the city of Toulouse, and they were orders where the monks would go out and uh, help poor people, preach and all of this, and the Augustan were supposed to stay inside their walls. Mm -hmm. So what they had 
aside from the fact that there's a whole scandal, which I won't go into, about how they got their land, because um, even in the, the Catholic Church and the monastic orders, there was a lot, a lot of rivalry and a lot of dissension about who would get how much money. And so the uh, Augustan, by, by virtue of some apparently somewhat devious dealings. And I am not sure exactly what that means, except that I think there was a little bit of under the table money going on somehow. Oh, um, well. yeah. they, they got uh, the, the uh, bishop or the archbishop to give them this chunk of land, which mm-hmm. of course you and I both know uh, it has been truncated since the French Revolution. And they built this absolutely magnificent, huge, huge monastery inside the old city center of of Toulouse, yeah. and that included uh, many, many auxiliary buildings which no longer are there, which disappeared with the French Revolution. Mm. And among the other things they did... I they, mean, they tore them down or they repurposed they tore them, them? They tore them down. Oh, they really? Them. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the parts that are there now are, in fact, there for the simple reason that it was saved for the specific reason of, of what it became. But what happened to the mon- monastic buildings is that uh, they included huge gardens... Mm-hmm. And the cloister, which of course is 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 really, I guess, uh, traditional to every single monastery or convent. There was yeah. always a cloister yeah. because that was where they would walk around. But also, and this is what makes this, of course, such a wonderful, wonderful place to visit even today. This was a real cloister garden. And that meant that it had a function. So it wasn't simply that you have a cloister, which is, of course, a square or rectangular space with galleries that are cl- covered so that you can walk around in this garden uh part of it was uh for feeding themselves with vegetables that they would grow part of it was medicinal plants for not only treating themselves but for going out and helping uh giving out this medicinal the medicinal plants to to people outside the monastery part of it was uh, fruit trees Mm -hmm. so that they could really be self-sustaining and then probably i mean it's not that big the courtyard is not that big but it had it had, and, and believe it or not, still has all these things. So, uh, yeah. and the fourth side was uh, simple trees and the well. Yes, there's a well. There's always yeah. a well, yeah. right? In the so, center. Is it in, in the, the center? On, on one side. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, it's always, sometimes in a cloister, it's in the center. Yeah. In, in, sometimes it's on the side. I think it depended on where they would dig. I really don't know how they decided where the well yeah. would be. Yeah. But what happened was that there was this Augustan monastery, and it was there then from when it was built in the 1300s, which is quite a while ago, mm-hmm. until uh, the time of the French Revolution. Uh, and in 1789 and 1790, uh, when the revolution came to Toulouse, because it obviously started in Paris, and so it took a little while, like everything in those days, to, <laughs> to finally get to the south, you know. I mean, it wasn't instantaneous on the internet, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but by the time they came here... Uh, the, the, the revolutionaries, and don't even ask me who those were, but they were obviously a whole mass of people. Uh, they were in the process of demantling and destroying almost all the monastic buildings everywhere in France, mm-hmm. including in Toulouse. Uh, and, right. and Toulouse had 17 monasteries and convents. Yeah. It's huge for the amount of space there actually is in the city of Toulouse. Yeah, and one thing that uh, this reminds me of is, uh, it's been mentioned on a few of the other shows, is the uh, L'Abbé de Cluny yeah. in Burgundy. It got almost totally destroyed. Totally. And it was huge. It was the biggest. Yeah, and this is rev- the French Revolution. Yeah, that and it, did that. But, but as an aside, you should know the reason it was the biggest is because it was the original home of the Benedictine Order mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. France. And so it was the headquarters monastery. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, it is uh, that one they sacked. They, they, it, was, it just represented too much of all kinds of things. And that one they didn't, there was no saving anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it just, yeah. They destroyed it. So, but this is what's so amazing. How this happened, I really, really don't know. But by the time the revolutionary uh, people came to Toulouse, th- in fact, the the Augustan monastery had only about three or four monks left in it because mm. most of them, the order was not, an, not a particularly important one. So it stopped having a lot of people entering it. And most mm-hmm. of the other monks had eventually left. I don't know where they went, to be honest. I have no idea. So when the revolutionaries came, they looked at the buildings. And uh, what had happened was that the buildings had been destroyed a little bit and rebuilt once because of a fire, once, believe it or not, because 
the church tower had been struck by lightning, mm. and so it had been uh, rebuilt. And that the, probably happened a lot. I would think so. I yeah, actually would I think mean, so. They didn't have lightning rods. The, the yeah. nice iron crosses up on the top were perfect for you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, hit me, you know. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> but the Augustan monastery had something that uh, some of the enlightened people that were part of the revolutionaries realized could be used in a different way. It happens that this particular monastery has an enormous, enormous, enormous church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it had side buildings that there are the side chapels and the, what are called the chapter house, which is the meeting house and all of these things besides, of course, the gorgeous cloister. And uh, it had started do they have dormitories right there? Yes, or they, they, they always did. They always had buildings right. that were basically the dormitory, and then they would have another building that was a huge open uh, dining hall, which called the refectory, which was uh, – those buildings, by the way, were destroyed, in fact. Okay, uh, okay. They were actually destroyed. But for for reasons that I really don't know, the, the monastery already housed – some pieces of other ancient churches and monasteries that had over time been destroyed. And so a committee of people from the revolution decided to keep the rest of what were standing as buildings belonging to this Augustan monastery Mm -hmm. and use it to make an art museum for medieval sculpture and art. And all of this happened extremely Early on, that is in 1790, which is really in the midst of the revolution. So that's interesting because on the one hand, they're destroying right old things, right. but at the same time, they are establishing a museum. They're establishing a museum and saving what is yeah, left yeah. of the building. And yeah. the honor we have is that the only other museum that had been opened to the public by 1790, but was not considered to be a totally public museum, was, in fact, the Louvre. Huh. The Augustin Museum is the first open to the public art museum in France. Oh, wow. In other words, not private, not a lord or a king yeah. or a duke or anything like that. And so they declared in 1793... The Augustan was declared an art museum. And what sort of... So they put art in there that they found from left and right and exactly. just but salvaged. They salvaged, and interestingly enough, uh, they they first started putting in pieces of sculpture. I wonder who the curator was of this. Uh... Well, there probably is a documentation that would tell us who the yeah, curator yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but so, so when they declared this, mm-hmm. they got a loan, which became, of course, a permanent loan, in uh, of of a whole collection of paintings mm. from the Louvre, oh, that were sent to the August Town, hmm. and believe it or not, it, it really became a very important, prestigious building. And the first public art school was established in one wing of the part of the buildings that were left standing. Oh, wow! So, but but, and here is where you get the irony of what the French Revolution did, anyway. The, the part that was the church that was huge, that is huge, because now, of course, you can go in and see it in its original structural form. Because this is the revolution, and they are anti-religion and anti-church, and they've turned this building into an art museum, what they did was they put the equivalent of plasterboard, except, of course, they didn't have plasterboard in, <laughs> in, in the 1790s and in 1800. So they plastered over. They plastered over and covered up all of the windows, the Gothic windows in the church, oh, and they put in a fake ceiling, lower than the beautiful pointed arched uh, <laughs> Gothic ceiling that's there now, and they blocked off all the natural light. I actually have some drawings in a book I have at home. Uh, and they used these walls, which are very, very high. They're, I'm not sure exactly, but they're at least 18 meters high. Yeah, it's a big church. It's a huge church. And they literally did what they started to do in the early 1800s, which was kind of ridiculous from our point of view, was they used it to stack up paintings, one on top of the other, all the way going up to the ceiling. And there are actually some drawings of what it looked like at the time. It looks like a kind of supermarket of paintings, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, how do you get the one all the way up on top? You have to use a stick with a hook on it, you know, get that one down. Um, and and they wanted it to be uh, secular and non-religious, and not, yeah. and people shouldn't see that it was once a church. So this is what happened. Oh. 
And then... You want to cover up the fact that it was a church? It, it's a church. You know, people are just weird. People are weird. Because on the outside, it's so obvious that it's a, it's church. a church. What are you going to do? Exactly. I mean, exactly. It's a church. And, and, and not only that, but they kept the name. So they didn't change the name. Yeah. They called it the Augustin Art Museum of the Republic of France in the South. Oh, well, there you go. How's that for a nice long That's name? That's much nicer than what it was the year before. <laughs> and bizarre. This, this is in 1808. Yeah. Napoleon, the Napoleon. Yeah, yeah. Comes through. Bonaparte. B- Mr. Bonaparte. He comes through Toulouse. <laughs> now, Napoleon is someone who, among other things... Uh, because we can talk forever and ever about what Napoleon was and what he did and all of that. Uh, he was a massive, uh, compulsive uh, collector of art and objects, m- some of which was bought, the most of which was simply taken. He was a kleptomaniac. He was uh, an obsessive <laughs> collector. <laughs> of large things. Of large <laughs> things, very large things. But he came to Toulouse to honor the city of Toulouse, and he brought with him a very small collection of magnificent paintings from the Renaissance, Flemish and Italian, Mm. and they are still part of the collection of the Augustin Museum, which ironically uh, adds a lot of uh, prestige to the painting part, but that is not what most people think of when they think of the Augustin Museum. So this is how the Augustin came to be a museum. And it's funny because I've been there so many times. Uh, f- first of all, uh, growing up in Toulouse, they, the school trips take you to, to right. visit the museum. Right. Uh, f- you know, I can't remember how many years, but we went with school. And my mom also liked going to museums, and so she took us. It, it, it's really, well, of course, it's one of the most beautiful museums. But, that sorry, sorry, I didn't finish in, in my Toulouse. thought. I didn't finish my thought. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the thought was... I've been there so many times, but I cannot tell you what's in it. You cannot. I cannot. Okay. Because when you go to a place too many times, you don't even look anymore. Right. Like it's uh, it becomes like part of the background. Right. It. If you ask me what art is in there, I'm like, well, I don't know. There's statues okay. So let me paintings. tell you. Okay. Good. Tell, tell me, me I will, and I'll I will try you. to pay attention. No, <laughs> not only that, but two other things that really make the museum quite interesting, not just from point of view of what the collection is. They. The revolutionaries, because let's begin, let's go back to them in the sense that they are the ones who we can thank for having saved the the building itself. They kept the cloister, Mm -hmm. and they kept the cloister in its original form so that none of the cloister was destroyed. The galleries with the gorgeous columns that are what hold up, of course, the gallery walls were kept, and they kept the original medieval garden. Now, Mm -hmm. this is what is so astounding. So today... In, in 2015, just like 200 years ago, the uh, city gardeners work to preserve what is a true medieval garden mm. cut into quadrants with one quarter being medicinal, one quarter being vegetables, one quarter being fruit, and the other being just a uh, well that is no longer actually used with a uh, cypress tree and, and a few other trees. Because now, of course, when we go to the garden and it has labels on everything, it's really nice. And as you say, they bring lots of school groups there. Mm-hmm. It's lovely. It's a uh-huh. gorgeous, gorgeous cloister. And you get an idea of what a medieval garden inside a monastery was like. Yeah. And now the other thing is, is that one side, the the south side of the cloister, remember these are open galleries all the way around, even though they're protected o- overhead, has a fabulous, absolutely fabulous collection of gargoyles. Mm-hmm. And the gargoyles were taken off of the various churches and monaster, monast- monastic buildings that were destroyed, but they salvaged some of them and they're standing on their bases so that you can go up, actually touch them, even though you're not really supposed to, um, look down <laughs> the mouth of them. Have you to pet a gargoyle? Have you ever, oh, it's wonderful <laughs> to pet a gargoyle. And you can actually stick your tongue out at them too, you know, and they do, do back the grimaces that they do. And you can walk. Be- What's wonderful is that they're freestanding. So when you walk around them, you see that a gargoyle is in fact a drain pipe and yeah. the upper part is, can- is, is open. It's, a, it's just a 
carved out open space, they're fabulous. It's mm-hmm. really great. You mm-hmm. walk into the gallery and you see this row of these huge gargoyles all with their mouths gaping open, you know, and it's really neat. Now, one of the I things... You take pictures of the gargoyles. Oh, you definitely, definitely, that definitely. should be fun. It should be really fun. Is there, there a natural light in there? There's enough natural light, yeah. Definitely there is. Do you and happen it, to know what side of... The... They're, on the, they're on the south side. On the south side, okay. Yeah, so you uh, obviously you'll have a play of light and shadow. It depends right. on which time of the day you right. go. Right, that's what I'm thinking. But it's a really, it's lovely. You know, the whole the whole cloister and 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 garden part is lovely. Now the museum is actually famous not for its paintings, which are kind of an aside, interestingly enough, even though there's a small, very important collection of them, but it's famous for housing more medieval sculpture and particularly it's famous for a part that was literally built on at the end of the 1800s to house all of these things it's famous for the largest collection of medieval carved capitals in france Mm -hmm. and the capitals for those who don't know are the very fancy sculptured part on the top of a column which goes back of course to the greeks and the romans you know and they probably just Took them from other churches and cloisters? And... In the Toulouse area. Okay. So everything in the museum is, in fact, not even from the Toulouse area. It's from all of the other monastic structures that were torn down that were filled with absolutely beautiful sculpture from the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. Yeah. And this is the most important collection in France of this kind of sculptural work. Mm-hmm. So... When the museum started to take on a certain importance during the course of the 19th century, they actually hired our famous Violet Le Duc, the man who redid pretty much everything that's still standing in France. But his name was Violet, not Violet. 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 Violet in English. I know. Violet is a girl. (laughs) All right. Violet Le Duc. I like calling him Violet. I don't know why. Violet, if you like. I know. Violet. Violet. I think it was Violet. It was Violet. Um... (laughs) They hired him to to come down, not to uh, repair the buildings that were standing, but to create a f- design for a wing that they wanted to add on to the museum. And it happens that this was in the 1870s, and by the time he finished the plans, he was an old man, and so he died very soon after that. And somebody else, who was one of his successors, took over the building of this wing that is, in fact, the wing where uh, down below on the on the first or ground floor, because it's actually up a few steps, but the first floor down below, is this magnificent collection of medieval capitals. And upstairs is an entire collection of fabulous paintings that cover both the original works offered by Napoleon and a couple of other people from the 1600s and 1700s there's really nothing earlier than that mm-hmm. some dutch masters some beautiful you know paintings of bowls of fruit and stuff like that uh, a whole huge section of portrait painting yeah. and historical things and then the biggest 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 part which has 19th century painting which includes some of the orientalist painting and even a few examples of angre and toulouse lautrec and people like that so it's not the major part in terms of the importance of the museum, the actual most important part is the sculpture because it also has a lot of church sculpture. It has a lot of friezes and statues and pieces, all of which, everything recuperated from Toulouse or the region around Toulouse. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, it has a fairly interesting collection of, of very nice paintings. And then the wing was finished only in the 1890s, so it's not that old. Yeah. But it was at least built in the same style as the rest of the old building. So even though it's a, it's, it's newer, really but... newer, yeah. it it works well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everything works together, and you really have to pay attention to realize that it doesn't look quite as old as the rest of the buildings, yeah. which yeah. really are a few hundred years and, earlier. And you know, I do remember walking through all those capitals and looking at them, and but you have to. Pay attention and maybe tell yourself, well, what story is this yeah. capital t- saying? Yeah. You know, because all of these tell a story. Right. And if you're not very familiar with the Bible, right. and even if you are, it's like sometimes you're like, uh, what am I looking at? To be very, very honest, I think that walking through the wing that has all of these capitals, um, there are probably 
I don't know the exact number, but there are certainly about a hundred of them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have somebody to explain some of what they are, yeah, it's hardly uh, possible to really understand anything that's going on, except you can see that there's some very fine work in terms of the carving done on them. Right. Not all of them, by the way, tell a story. Some of them have just monsters yeah. and vegetal things and things like that. But, <laughs> but, but it is true that it's an art form that's very obscure for us, and it is very hard to really appreciate unless you can have either a guide or a guide book or something yeah. that helps you understand because do they have audio guides. No, okay. they do not. And, uh, th- there is a book, but I don't believe that it actually gives you a, a story of each of the capitals. It may tell you about two or three of them. Yeah. 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 The most famous ones. Well, know. but even in places where they, like I was in uh, Arla recently and yeah. there's this beautiful cloister with a few of the capitals are actually pretty famous. Yeah. I mean, you, they don't tell you about every single no. one of them. There's so many, right. and they all have different faces. And you know, so this one tells the story of Martha slaying the dragon, mm. whatever right. you know. Um, but you have to; somebody has to point it out. Yeah, I think the idea is, if you are not an expert, it's just to see a few of them to have an idea of what they represent and tell the, the story they tell, so you get to appreciate the skill that went into the making of them. And do they label them? Well, that's the thing. Some of them, they label, and they label them with the story, because they are, of course, all from the Bible. So, for instance, if I remember correctly, I believe there are two or three that are uh, David in the lion's den, because that was right. a very popular theme. There's also uh, uh, the... John the Baptist having his, and Salome, uh, mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite ones because you get to see her walking around with the platter with his head on it. It's kind of yeah. gruesome, but it's kind of fun to see. Um, there's one that's lovely that shows, uh, it's, if I remember correctly, the story in the Bible is, um, okay, you're going to have to correct me on this one because I'm not that good on my stories from the Bible, but it shows Christ in a boat and he's pulling fish out of the water. Yeah. And, uh, you, you, this is all of course made out of limestone. So it's, yeah. it's not very big, you know, they're, they're about a foot and a half wide or something, but it, you see the miracle of the fish and, uh, yeah. the fish are jumping out of the water and the water is these gorgeous curved lines. Okay. Uh, so I don't remember which story that is. I have well, to Well, the uh, fisherman was St. Pierre, was, uh, Peter. There was, it had to do with the miracle that he performed. I'm not sure which one Okay. Else. Okay. We'll have to look that one up. I don't fishes and the loaves? Yeah. Fish, maybe. Fishes and loaves, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. That might maybe. be it. But, but, uh, <laughs> but the, now to, to go back to the building itself and the museum itself, by the end of the 1800s, mm-hmm. the people who were the curators and who really ran the museum, which was now, of course, considered to be a very prestigious museum, right. realized uh, what a ridiculous thing it had been to cover up all the windows inside the building part that was the church. Yeah, And so uh, in 1892, the art school, which had been squatting basically the Augustan since... Uh, 1810, was moved to its current location, mm-hmm. which is a building along the Garan River, and that freed up a part of the building. They decided to modernize everything, and at the same time, they decided to take off all of the, the, plaster. Uh, the plaster and the wood that had been covering up the ceiling, covering up the windows, yeah. and gave it back its original form. Okay. So today, of course, when you go into the museum, even though it is a course still a, just a museum space you do see this magnificent uh, architecture inside the gothic church mm-hmm. covered with its original decoration its original painting on the walls so they and restored all of that they restored all of that the natural light coming through and that part is now used partly for organ concerts because mm-hmm. uh, we know that Toulouse is a very big organ city. There are yeah. lots of churches that have wonderful organs, and there's a very nice one in the uh, church of the Augustan uh, Museum. But also the other half of the church space is where they put on all their temporary exhibits. Right. And they have had some very, very wonderful ones, yes. especially in the last few years. Thank goodness uh, the, there's a certain decentralization of money so that the Minister of Culture has given our region enough so that the Augusta Museum has had a couple of really very nice, prestigious exhibits 
one a couple of years ago that was wonderful that was of uh, Caravaggio and Caravaggio painters Uh and one this past year that was very, very popular of Orientalist painting, Mm -hmm. which is very exotic painting about North Africa, but famous artists, Delacroix and people like that from the 19th century. So the museum has kept up in a sense with the times, even though it's devoted to work only really up to the end of the 19th century and the very first couple of years of the 20th century. That's yep. it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a place where if you are a resident of Toulouse, uh, you can get a special card so that you can go on weekends. Uh, it's also because it is really a museum. Uh, it is open all the time. It doesn't have a date that is closed, although they're threatening to start doing that. Um, and on Wednesday nights, it's open late, and they apparently have organ music every Wednesday night. I don't usually go on Wednesday nights. Uh-huh. Uh, and when we have our Fête de la Musique, oh, yeah, which will be coming really up, good, yeah. they always have really good stuff. Yes. And this is what I love about France in general. that like take a museum like this, which has parts of it from the 1300s and 1400s, and um, they spread out different kinds of music the night of the Festival of Music, which, of course, now is pretty much all over Western Europe anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, June 21st. June 21st. And you walk from room to room and you can listen to Middle Eastern music or Renaissance music or contemporary jazz music yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's always uh, a, a nice place to go. So it's it's one of my two really most favorite uh, museums in, in Toulouse. But also, I just like it because of what it is. I like the fact that it's kept its medieval gardens and cloisters. It's, as you say, from the outside, really does look like a church. Yeah. And it's all brick, and it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And uh, what I realized, looking, checking up some historical information, what I didn't know was that the part you were describing that in front of the entranceway with the little fountain and the, the garden, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's really, really recent. That was done in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, yeah, so which, in my which, lifetime. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't. I thought it was maybe done in the 19th century when they was, you know, turning it into a museum. Yeah. But no, that was part of another form of urban renewal that they did in the more recent uh, past, as we can call it that. Yeah, yeah. You know? And of course, they chopped off a whole part of it that has now become other things and shops and stuff like that. But it's it's very lively. It's it's I like it. It's uh, yeah. It's dead center in Toulouse. I mean, it's, dead center in Toulouse. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a nice uh, and, and what I think is fun is that my guess is that most of the people who visit the museum just have no idea that it was number one the first public art museum in all of France after the revolution. I didn't. If I knew that, it didn't register, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, uh-huh, it's pretty good for Toulouse. Yeah, and uh, I like its history, you know. Oh, and I have to tell this story because it has nothing to do with being a museum, but it is a true story. <laughs> In the 1500s, there was a bit of a scandal Mm. because these are monks who are supposed to be hermits, which means they don't leave the monastery buildings, even though it's right in the head, the dead center of medieval Toulouse. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly how it was found out. I don't know if somebody who was one of the auxiliary people that helped them with the cooking or whatever it is, but the word got out that some of the monks were receiving ladies inside ah. the walls of the museum. Ah. Now, this is a real no-no, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm told. I'm this told. Is, <laughs> this is a real no-no, you know. And uh, the problem was that the Augustan were not well-liked by various other monastic groups because they were latecomers, they were upstarts. I mean, it's so uh-huh. weird to read all of this kind of stuff. So they had they got into a lot of trouble, and a couple of the <laughs> brothers were actually, I think, asked to leave. Mm, dissolute uh, business. Diso- dissolute, dissolute. Yes, they were yeah. they were um, corrupting the 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 others. Well, definitely. I mean, it. that yeah, don't do that. If you're so, gonna be a monk, don't do that. Don't, yeah, if you're if you're gonna be a monk, <laughs> you know, I guess it means if you're gonna be a monk, do it in the countryside where you don't have too much temptation, you know, because uh, obviously there were people that they had contact with in yeah, the, inside yeah. the city. But then, anyway, so that's the history of the yeah. August town. So yeah. It's a very nice place. I, I must say, I, having been there many, many times, I would gladly go again. I mean, it's just, you know. It's great. I, what I, one of the and you go in for Fête de la Musique. I almost always go in. So always. They, and I remember going to exhibitions there that had to do with the history of Toulouse. Mm-hmm. Um, they just have, they always have something going on. Yeah. Um, so it's, 
you know, maybe once a year, I I so happen to go for whatever reason. So it's 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 one that's pretty lively. It's pretty lively, and, and they it, have stuff <coughs> for kids too. Yes, I was gonna say. I was just, in fact when my, when my daughter was little, we used right. to. They yeah. allow them to come in and sit down. I love it when you watch them sitting and trying to draw the gargoyles or, or mm-hmm. walk around the cloister or go into the other spaces, and they have a very nice outreach educational program, yep, yep. Which, uh, which is another thing that I think is very good because uh, it, it makes a, a museum more a part of de- everyday life in a city that way. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't yeah. have an elitist feel to it. It's, yeah. it's really anchored in the history of the city of Toulouse. All right. Okay. That's a good one. So that's a good one, and that, of course, is in the Dead City Center, which means it's really accessible by, by metro, by by bus. You can walk pretty much from anywhere. Yeah, and, in and Toulouse, get there. If, it's really hard not to walk. It's really past hard it. not to walk past <laughs> it. <laughs> so now the other one, our other A uh, building, the Abattoir. Well, uh-huh. now that's you, the gruesome one. That's the gruesome one. Now <laughs> the Abattoir, interestingly enough, is. Um, uh, on the other side of the river, it's yeah. on the other side of the Garonne, and uh, it's in uh, the neighborhood of Saint Cyprien, right? Which, for uh, centuries and centuries and centuries, really for very, very, very long time, was the bad part of uh, Toulouse. And <laughs> it was the bad part of Toulouse for several reasons. It was the bad part because it was the part where there were the hospitals, which of course in the Middle Ages meant that you had all the people Disease. that were diseased, the lepers, the people with the plague. Um, and of course it was also the, the area where there were lots of poor people and a lot of bandits. And so it was what we would call mal fréquenté. Yes, yes. And apparently, it was like that for a very long time, up through into the 1800s. Huh. And uh, it, it, it's because it's on the other side of the river, it was an area that most people really didn't care about. So what happened was that traditionally, in I don't know if this is just in France, but it happens that it wasn't the case in France, cities built along a river often used a part of the river to do the slaughtering of their animals for meat. Uh, yes. And, of course, the uh, term abattoir means slaughterhouse. Yes, it was a slaughterhouse. It was a slaughterhouse. Yeah. And in Toulouse, starting way, way back, maybe even with the Romans, I'm not sure, the river, the Garonne, was used, a part of the river was used, that was where they slaughtered the animals, so, you know, it polluted the waters. It's pretty disgusting anyway. And, of course, then they eventually used the hides and tanned the hides. So Mm. all of this activity was connected to the river. And uh, it was uh, at the end of the 1700s, beginning of the very uh, 19th century, the 1800s, with these new enlightened ideas, you know, Mm -hmm. open parks and cleaning up the city and all of this, uh, the city decided that it was finally time to move the abattoir to a specific place. And instead of having apparently lots of small different ones in different parts of the city, they unified them all and they decided to have built specifically for that purpose one big structure on the other side of the river, but very close to it, but in more modern sanitary conditions considering when it was done. And they asked... Urban Vitry, who is a very interesting man. Uh, um, Urban Vitry was the head architect of the city of Toulouse, mm. and he was the nephew of the Virabon family, who were the family that built all of the wonderful, wonderful things starting in the 1600s made out of brick. And they invented the idea of decorative brick and making beautiful statuary out of terracotta and all of this. Mm. So it was kind of a dynasty of people working in brick and adding to the style of uh, architecture of Toulouse. And Urban Vitry, uh, at the age of 28, who had apparently been a brilliant student of architecture, he uh, was named head chief architect for the city of Toulouse Hmm. in the uh, very beginning of the 1820s. And they asked him to come up with a design for this new, very modern uh, slaughterhouse. Hmm. Hmm. In 1823... They, they, the city gave him this chunk of land that leads on to the, the Garonne River on yeah. the other side. Yeah. And he built uh, what is this incredible building that is in three parts. So there's a central part, which is in uh, what's called neoclassical architecture style, very symmetrical with a pointy roof, all of it very beautiful in 
beautiful brick. And then he built this semicircle of small buildings all the way around it that were used as specific slaughterhouse buildings originally. That was the original function of them. And they were added on a section that went over to the river because this is, what, about 100 meters from the river. Yeah. Uh, and they had this in three sections. And this became the central slaughterhouse oh, for I all see. the animals. And the way they divided it was according to the kinds of animals, et cetera, et cetera. And they had all this land around it that was used so that it would the, – the, the wastes were not just dumped into the river. So it was this very new modern idea starting in the 1820s. And this became a very, very important building. Ironically, uh, a beautiful building designed by this man named Vitri, who also did Plas Wilson. He designed all these other things. He did other the buildings nice on the Capitol Square with this incredible aesthetic. And it's the slaughterhouse. Yeah. And it's all made, of course, uh, of this gorgeous brick that we use pretty much everywhere in Toulouse. <clears throat> now, what's amazing is that this is on the outside of the medieval walls that surrounded this part of, of Toulouse, the San Cyprian area. Right. So it was considered cleaner because it was no longer in the city itself. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And would you believe that it was the slaughterhouse from 1823 until... 1978. Right. I remember when they stopped that. So you do remember when they I stopped it? I do remember it. when they stopped that. See, I hadn't realized I was that. 13. Was, I hadn't realized that the slaughterhouse was there until yeah. that late in the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, of I don't course, know where it is today, but. Uh, I don't know either, but I know it's farther outside the city. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the sanitation rules changed. And so they, they have moved it, of course, like just uh, with Paris. I mean, they moved all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. You don't see it anymore, yeah. right? Now, I remember when I first came to Toulouse, uh, what I saw was the buildings that are, of course, still standing because they did not destroy them because it was classified in spite of the fact that they stopped using it as a slaughterhouse because it was designed by this architect, Urban Vitry, the buildings themselves were immediately classified as m monuments, right. historical monuments, to be preserved. Right. But when I first showed up in Toulouse, what I remember seeing is these basically run-down buildings yes. surrounded by just these ugly fields that looked like dumping ground for yeah. all kinds of industrial waste. Well, the thing is, if they don't do anything with an area, then very quickly it's just going to turn into nasty. Nasty, you, you know? know. Lots of graffiti, lots yeah. of garbage dumped everywhere. It, yeah. it, it was very strange for me because, you know, there are so many other parts of the city that are so beautiful. And I kept thinking, why did they allow this to happen? And it's so close to the yeah. river and everything else. And that was my first visit to Toulouse. And then I went away and then I came back a couple of years later. And that's when I found out that after some deliberation, uh, the city council with money from uh, obviously the region and the minister of culture had decided since they had to find a function for these buildings that could not be destroyed, that they were going to turn it into a modern art museum mm -hmm. and that it would be a museum of 20th century art since the August town basically pretty much stops at the very beginning of the 20th century. And that was 90s, This right? was, the project was developed in the 1980s. Okay. They actually started working on it in the 1990s it took an enormous amount of time. There was a huge amount of delay, and I don't know if the delay was because of a change in the plans. I really don't know if, what the reasons were. Mm -hmm. When I f arrived in Toulouse in 97, uh, I found out about it, and because of the work I had been working with museums in the States and New York, I immediately went to contact the people that would be in charge of the abattoir to see if I could get some kind of work with them. Yeah. And they told me that there was all this, uh, what, I hate to use the word, but I am going to use it, rigmarole, um, <laughs> all of this, you know, these rules about who could be hired and not hired because the money was coming from the DRAC, which is the regional uh, resource of cultural money, mm. the Minister of Culture, that there were various people that had to be consulted. They couldn't just hire anybody. And uh, they told me that there was a huge delay and it was getting to be problematic, they thought they would be open in 98. In fact, they didn't open until the year 2000. Right. right. So uh, in the year 2000, 
having more or less given up on the idea of ever getting work with them. And of course, by that time, I was uh, working as a guide and also teaching at the art school. What happened was I kind of stopped going past it. So I didn't really pay attention very much. And you don't, I mean, unless you live nearby, you wouldn't go past it. It's, right. it's unlike the Augustin where it's hard not to be, see it yeah. if you're in city center. Yeah. Right? Uh, but that, that one is a little off center. I mean, it's, it's not anymore. It's very heavily populated. Right. And, right. But, but it's not right, right in but the center. It's not right, right in the center. So you have to be on the other side. You have to be driving past yeah. it. But, but what was amazing to me was that after I remember having driven past it many times and thinking this is really kind of grungy, you know, everything. And then probably there were probably, I don't know how many months that I hadn't gone past it. And lo and behold, one day driving by and I went, whoa, because mm -hmm. not only have they fixed up the buildings, which of course, in terms of their exterior, look exactly the same way that they had been when they were built to be uh, the, the uh, slaughterhouse buildings, but they had turned the land right around it into the most gorgeous park. Yeah, the park and is nice. So what you have is this building that has three sections and the reason it has three sections is because it really does, in fact, have three functions because it is at the same time in the central building, which is very, very beautiful to see inside and out, a collection of 20th century art with t some very contemporary works. Mm -hmm. And it has two permanent collections and then it has uh, rotating visiting exhibits, usually two or three a year. And then it has a section that is... Uh, library and uh, educational functions for people bringing in school groups. And then mm -hmm. there's a third part that's archives and that is a research center. Oh, okay. So it actually has developed as a what's called an art resource area as well as being the art museum. And then what they did, which I thought was wonderful, because... To me, just like with the Augustan, it's true you have a little bit of a space in front and you have to go inside to appreciate the cloisters and the park and all of that. But here what they did was they made this magnificent park that includes a section in the back of the museum that actually takes you to steps that look out over the Garan, and they renovated the medieval walls that are the boundary on the other side of the park so that you have this huge complex of space now that is both... The museum, which is an art museum of contemporary modern art, a huge park called the Raymond Seventh Park, mm -hmm. and the medieval walls, which are beautiful because they just fixed them up so that they look exactly the way they did in the 13 and 1400s. And what they do is they use the outer part of those walls in the summertime for an outdoor photography exhibit, right. which makes it very lively. And again, it's this, uh, at least the museum, I have to say, is probably more obscure and elitist for most people, even than the Augustan, because contemporary art and 20th century art is not really yeah, everyone's if, taste. Yeah, if you right? like it, you like it, but it but doesn't draw huge crowds. It doesn't crowds. draw the biggest crowds in the world, but every once in a while they have an exhibit that's successful. But you can walk through the grounds you can either go into the museum and visit it because it's not very expensive uh, to entrance. I think it's six or six or seven euros to get yeah. into the museum. Yeah. So you can, if you wish, go in and visit the museum. One of the things it has is a very famous, huge piece by Picasso, which is a curtain that he designed for an opera piece, and it's uh, one of the major pieces. That's a Picasso. Yeah, the the huge <laughs> curtain downstairs that's designed. Yeah. It was designed for a, an opera, but the space is beautiful to see as an architectural space. Yeah. And then there's a cafe out back. Yeah. And from there you can take a look out over the river and hang out in the park. And, and I just think it's great. And what's the pink bowel thing? Oh well, the pink bowel thing. <laughs> You what, know exactly what I mean, don't you? The pink bowel <laughs> thing, I don't even remember the name of the artist, was added about five years ago. It was, an, it was, an, it was given, I, don't re, I honestly don't remember the name of the artist. It's a sculpture on the outside in the, in the gardens. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a gift of a sculptor to the museum. So they, they put it up because, of course, they do do very, very contemporary work there. Uh -huh. uh, but nobody likes it. <laughs> I've never met anybody who likes no, it. No, nobody likes it. It looks like it's, a big intestine. Well, yeah, it does. Pink. It's pink. But, but and it's very large. It's very it's large. Very large. It's, it's true. Like, 
five or six meters tall and five or six meters wide. Oh yeah, yeah, it's the, it's and, at least that big. And, uh, but but and you drive fast, and that's the one thing people see when they drive. You think by. so? Maybe. Well, yeah, everybody because it's colored. Pink. If I'm gonna tell somebody. Uh, it's a batois, and they're like, what's that? And I'm like, the thing with a big pink vowel. And right. Everybody knows what it is. That's true. That's true. Uh -huh. But I think most people like me. I think that's a disservice. Well, they, you know I what? Don't know. I've, I don't pay attention to it. I guess that's the thing now. It's like when I go there, if I go there, I go to see what's inside of the course, museum. Of course, of course. Or I go to enjoy the 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 park and also I love, absolutely love what they did with the steps and the esplanade behind the museum yes. that gives you not only a view of the river, but yes. there's a walkway with uh, yes. that you can go on, a kind of causeway, where you can walk along the river and really feel the rushing water coming yes, out. Yes, you can hear the river. You're the view is spectacular, yeah. absolutely yeah, no, spectacular. It's nice. So it it's really nice. It is a nice area nice. anymore. I mean, I know that the city around there, the city is reclaiming some yeah. of the buildings yeah. because... The, they weren't being renovated, they weren't being kept up, and so they were turning into something nasty. Right. And so the city is actually buying They're out. They're gentrifying yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And it's not people doing it. It's the city buying whole blocks right. of this stuff, and they're going to try and resell it and develop it. But the other thing is, the, it's true that this small old area of the uh, called San Ciprian that's very close to the museum... Uh, was until very recent times not very clean and it was relatively poor, but by some virtue of it, some of it is still not awesome. I mean, you it, know, it, well, it's it's not like that anymore though, in the sense that there are two things that have changed. One, by ha by virtue of having the art museum there, and by if you walk across the bridge to the other side, you have the art school, and then you have another building, which maybe I'll talk about another time, which is the, the Chateau d'Eau, which is another very interesting structure art, that, yeah. that's become an art of photography exhibit mm -hmm. space. What has happened is that the first thing that helped change that area was that a lot of artists moved in. Mm -hmm. A lot of art students and a lot of artists moved well, in. Well, and the rent was probably cheaper. And the I rent mean, was cheaper. Yeah. And now what is happening is that little by little, uh, it's becoming a kind of young people's art area. Yeah. So it's kind of nice. You the know, university, you have, there's some university housing along there, right? I no? don't no, I don't think so. No, hmm. but but you have a lot. It's turned into basically a kind of hip young area, so that you have uh, a bunch of little restaurants, a bunch of yeah. little nice wine bars. Uh, oh, and there was the Carmen restaurant and the there, Carmen the, restaurant. The, the, that was the which the, is the meat restaurant. Is it still there? I think they're moving it. I don't know if it's moved oh. already or. But Which I was a very famous restaurant. I've never actually eaten in it. I don't know. Any, I mean, I know it was I mean, there for neither. a long I time. But yeah. I, everybody talks about right. it. Right. But what they did do, thanks to the fact that they had uh, decided to do this work on the museum, was they added that complex of very nice apartment buildings that are right on the water. Yeah. Uh, which are really quite lovely. Yeah. With, uh, with and, a beautiful view. And I think what I... I guess the reason I find it interesting is s much less for what is actually the collection inside the museum, although sometimes they have things that I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. But what I like is what they managed to do based on dealing with saving that building and renovating it in terms of what they did to the whole area. Yeah. So that they made this park, they yeah. made these beautiful apartment buildings. And so you have a, a very nice... Y yes, there's a small old section of San Ciprian that's still a little... It's grungy. It's mm -hmm. not dangerous it's, anymore. No, it's, grungy, it's just yeah. grungy. But, but at the same time... Maybe because I, I'm used to, to places, cities where you have a small artist area that's always a little bit like that. It starts out being that way. Because what happens afterwards is that rich people move in, up the price of real estate, yeah. and then the young artists have to go somewhere else. Yeah, yep. you know, so it's kind of fun to walk around the, uh, in that area and see that it's got yeah. this kind of artist colony kind yep, of yep, quality yep. to it. Yep. Uh, so... I mean, I've been a few times because my daughter happens to like the art there. Yeah. She likes modern art. Well, so. good. She has good taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she likes modern everything. Sometimes yeah. um, she plays me music. I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's, <laughs> you know, we were just, just as a last thought because, you know, we're, I know we're, we're going to end. But uh, just like you need to have a little bit of an explanation to be able to appreciate the uh, columns that were carved in the 1100s, mm -hmm. I think you really also need some information to appreciate modern and contemporary art. 
And I think that that's probably true for a lot of the work that yeah. exists in museums. Yeah. And I think that that... And uh, in France, know. we're not real good about putting explanations no. on the museum. No. I mean, like, even if you do take the time to read everything that the signs that you'll see, it it's not ma designed to explain very much. No, it's not a very strong point uh, in a lot of places. It really isn't. Yeah, it, yeah. It, unfortunately, it is a problem. Well, but. I wonder if it's because they, maybe if they're not sure, they don't want to interpret things just because they don't want to get it wrong? No, I think it's, there are two, no, I don't think it has anything to do with that. Yeah. I think it's, number one, money. Because in order to uh, have more explanation, you have to pay people to do the writing. And uh, I, uh, the, the other problem with that is that a lot of things, and this is true here in Toulouse, but also in a lot of other places, are not necessarily written in any other language other than in French. Yeah. Which makes it very hard for tourists and visitors to really understand what they're looking at. Yeah. And I think it's yeah, a combination. We have... We have Visitors from all over Europe and lots of Spanish speaking people, a lot of English speaking people. German and they don't <laughs> right. necessarily read French. Right. You know, I mean that's just how it is. But I think that it's a combination of budget and a certain amount of just laziness. Mm. I really do think that that's what it is. Yeah. But no, it um, might be. But anyway, so there's my two A's of the Augustin <laughs> and the Abattoir. And of course, if you want to take a tour with Elise, you can get a hold of her and um, and arrange that. Cause and that would be lovely because yeah. I love talking yeah. about all those things. You give really interesting tours. I've been on many of them and they're, they're and, really good. And, you know, once you get started with the art stuff, you know, there's just no stopping. <laughs> it. Yeah. But even the gargoyles, I love saying hi to them, you know. Well, and at the beginning <laughs> of the show, I forgot to ask you what you've been up to since we last talked. And you've been to up to a lot of stuff, haven't you? Well, I was uh, back in Paris with a few different groups. But I, it was okay if I just make a clarification because I actually had somebody who wrote to me. I do private visits. That mm -hmm. is, I don't do uh, kind of open visits like the people. There are lots of people, of course, in Paris who kind of stand on a street corner and uh, people just show up at a given time. Yes. I do prearranged, you know, organized visits with, okay. with either s groups or individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that's largely what I do, you know. Right. Um, and that I do, of course, in Paris, and I do in Toulouse, and I do pretty much everywhere. You know, all the people that I've seen that do like they just stand around and wait for people to come join them, is I, they're usually really young, you know. <coughs> well, there are two things <clears throat> in Paris, particularly because there are so 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 many tourists. Um, yeah, uh, there are two things. One, you have uh, legitimate, licensed guides like me yeah. who actually advertise in the little magazines like Periscope and things like that. And yeah. they have a full schedule. Uh, and then you have these young people who are actually bought a part of an association. That's in a whole other story because they aren't guides. They're just, they're trained to sort of, you know, say a few stories and fun things about some places and, and that's yeah. something else. But Paris is, Paris is a, a very big city. And you can do that in Paris because there's, yes, there's so, so many people. There's so much, yeah. But in Toulouse, I mean, there's... There, there's not, no. Yeah. But I just, I just wanted to mention that because I actually have a couple of people who've written to me uh, and have asked me, well, you know, like uh, on a specific day, wh what visit am I doing in Paris? But I don't work that way. I go to Paris to be with groups that are, it's a kind of right. so if somebody, reserved ahead of time. So if somebody wants to organize a group of eight or ten people or whatever. Or and, even four or five. Right, you know. and have you show them around Paris right, for a can. few days. They can contact me. Right, that, that they can do. But, right. but just for two people, it's probably not going to be... Well, it depends. I mean, it depends on what they want, but but mostly, I think I just want to say that it's to it's a prearranged thing. It's yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 worked out as a. It's not like I say, okay, I'm just going to be there. Whoever shows up, shows up. That yeah, kind yeah, of thing, yeah, you yeah. Know, so. Yeah, that makes sense. But anyway, so I have been in Paris a lot and seeing some new things and uh, doing a few things here. I did a couple of really interesting visits uh, a couple of weeks ago where I talked about the history of all the bridges. We have a whole lot of stuff going on to do with the bridges, you know. Mm -hmm. So somehow in the spring, I'm inspired to do things that have to do with water. <laughs> <laughs> lots of rain here. Uh, lots of rushing water. Although today it's nice. No rain yet. No, no rain Big, yet. Big, fluffy 
white clouds. The river was very high the other day, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It well, really we've, was. we've had quite a bit of rain. You know, so so we have, you know, there's lots of lots of interesting things going yeah. on. Yeah, so. wonderful. And we're heading into the hopefully warmer weather. <laughs> hopefully. No, it will. It's, it's going to get so hot. We'll have to talk about You'll things that sorry. connected. I was thinking uh, maybe we could do a, a a podcast about the parks and gardens. That would be lovely. That would be lovely, huh? Yes, that would be lovely. Spring yes. inspires me to do things like that, you know? <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe next time we get together. That would be a good idea. That would be a good idea. All right. Are we done for today? We're done. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for listening, and we'll, we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Au revoir. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Join Us in France Travel Podcast. For more on this topic and many others, check out our Facebook page. I put a lot of information there that never makes it into the episodes. And hmm, how, how do I say this without sounding too French and too blunt? Okay, I'll just say it. On Facebook, you need to be social. If you don't click like and if you don't comment... Facebook will assume that you're not that into it and they will stop displaying stuff from the Join Us in France Travel podcast to you. Really? You? You're not that much into preparing your trip to France? I really don't believe that. You guys are Francophiles. So just, just, just click like and say things and then you'll be good. All right. Happy vacation planning and don't be a stranger. Au revoir. <laughs>